Hey guys, uh, these are a couple of topics that have come up repeatedly over the past few days um, and then this morning's uh, problem solving session as well. So hopefully you can keep track of a couple of these things. They're common mistakes um, and since they've come up frequently, I, I figured I'd address them. So the first argument is something like this. Uh, well, actually, no, sorry. So here, uh, students are thinking that they would use the dominating terms argument by saying, well, sine x is well behaved, it stays between negative one and one at all times. So e to the x goes to positive infinity. So e to the x would dominate sine x in the numerator. And then the e to the x would dominate the denominator, it's the only one term there. This argument would be incorrect. Dominating term arguments can only be used if x is approaching infinity or negative infinity. So please, please, please do not use re relative rates of growth or related rates of growth if x is approaching anything other than positive infinity or negative infinity. Those are the only two things we care about because when we're finding relative rates of growth, we're looking at end behavior. Remember, we don't care about what happens at x equals zero or at x equals a million or even x equals a trillion to the billionth power. We care about what's happening to the function as it goes all the way out to positive infinity or all the way out to negative infinity on the other side. With a question like this, all you have to do is just plug in zero and see what happens. Um, and it'll turn out that sine of zero is zero, so that just goes away. Minus three times e to the zero would just be three e to the 0 would be 1, and then 2 times e to the 0 would be 2, and the answer would be negative 3 halves. Very simple question. If you think about it the wrong way, you might make a mistake. Now, this would get full credit on the test. However, if you said that, hey, this is the same limit as x approaches 0 of negative, negative 3 over uh, 3 e to the x over 2 e to the x, because you're using dominating terms. Otherwise, there's no reason to ignore the sine x. This would indicate if you write this and then you say, oh, e to the x is cancel, and you get limit as x approaches 0 of negative 3 halves, which gives us negative 3 halves, you'll notice that the answers are the same. This would lose you all points. This would be a complete 0 because you're using the wrong mathematical argument. You're using dominating terms when x is not approaching infinity or negative infinity. In fact, not only that, these two limits are not the same as x is approaching zero. They, they really are not. Or, yeah, I, I think I'll leave that at that. Summary uh, of the last few minutes is you cannot use dominating terms arguments or relative rates of growth in order to solve limits where x is not approaching infinity or negative infinity. If x is approaching infinity or negative infinity, then you can say, hey, this type of function grows faster than this type of function. So it'll be the dominating term on top versus the dominating term on the bottom. And then you can compare those. But th this would net you, oops. This would be an absolute zero because you're doing something. And even though you're getting the right, the right answer, y you got lucky that that was the case. Uh, next is uh, composition of, actually, I'll start with interpretations of average rate of change and instantaneous rate of change. This is absolutely fundamental to understanding probably 60 to 70% of the course. So just memorizing this makes absolutely no sense. If you understand it deeply, then you can solve problems in the future and on this upcoming test as well. If you don't understand it, but you try to memorize your way out of it, it's not going to work. So the formula for the average rate of change is f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And typically, it's average rate of change on some interval a to b. So that's what a and b are. And then there's some function f involved. The instantaneous rate of change is at x equals some number, whatever that number happens to be. It might be a, for instance. 
but it's happening at a specific x value, the averages over some interval, some time period from A to B. The average rate of change also gives us the slope of the secant line. And it is also given by and is equivalent to the difference quotient. Hopefully you remember uh, from past courses and perhaps even this one, the difference quotient formula is f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And we discussed all this in class a couple of different times. The instantaneous rate of change is the limit of the average rate of change as the distance between the two points gets closer and closer to zero. So if you wanted to find what the instantaneous rate of change was, all you had to do was really interpret the thing on the left as a limit as the distance gets closer and closer to zero. So there's a couple of different ways to think about this. The instantaneous rate of change is the limit of the average rate of change. I mean, that's the primary definition. It is the limit of the slope of the secant line. So really, just you're sticking a limit in front of the definition of the average rate of change. And it is also the limit of the difference quotient. The formula for finding the average rate of change is the limit as, x appro oh, as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. So as you can see, this is the difference quotient. This is the limit. Hence the phrase limit of the difference quotient. And finally, there's one more interpretation for instantaneous rate of change. And that is that it is the slope of the tangent line. So it's vital for us to keep both of these columns super duper duper clear in our heads. So if and when you get a question that says, hey, find the limit of the average rate of change, you shouldn't be thinking, ah, I wonder if that's the average rate of change or is it instantaneous? No pun intended, you should instantaneously know what you're being asked for. If I say find the slope of the secant line and find the limit of the slope of the secant line, you should know that one is an average rate of change and the other is an instantaneous rate of change. Notation and language is very, very, very important and it needs to be precise. Uh, partial memory is probably more dangerous in this course than incomplete or non-memory. If you just don't know something, you're probably safer than if you know half of something, because then you can do real damage. You can keep going between the two different columns and, and not end in a good spot. Now, one of the questions that's come up frequently is, uh, how is it that these two formulas are the same when they don't look the same? How can they give the same answer if they, you know, one's got A's and B's, the other's got X's and H's, how on earth are they the same? So it's a valid question and a good one. Let's draw a picture to try to explain it. So there's two points here. And I'm going to actually copy paste the same photo over to the right so that you see that it's, it's really the same exact thing with no difference whatsoever. So same picture, same function, same drawing, same everything. On the left-hand side, let's call this function f, therefore it's also f. If this point is a and this point is b, we can write the coordinates of this point as a comma f of a. The y-coordinate would just be a plugged into the function. The coordinates of this point would be b comma f of b. And if I make a line that joins these two points, hopefully it's straight enough, and I can do the same thing here. If we wanted to find the slope of this line, we would be finding the slope of the secant line because it cuts the function in two spots instead of being tangent. The formula for the slope of this function uh, of this line on the left hand side would be y2 minus y1. So f of b is y2 
minus f of a, which is y1, over x2, which is b, minus x1, which is a. And this is the familiar formula for average rate of change, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. It's really just y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. There's no difference between the two. We're just using different letters, and we're talking about a curvy function instead of a straight line. Now, on the picture on the right, let's call this point x. Notice that this is just a label. We're just talking about some x-coordinate. The uh, coordinates for this point would be x comma f of x. Again, we're taking x and we're plugging it into the function, and whatever the output is, that becomes the y value or the output value. On the left-hand side, we had two points that we had chosen, and then we said, hey, A is fixed, and B is going to move closer and closer to A. We can reframe that same exact argument, the same exact motion of one point being fixed and the other point moving closer and closer and closer by saying, instead of picking the location of the second point that moves left and right, think about the distance between the two points, and what happens if we shrink the distance down to zero. Doesn't that mean that the two points get closer to each other? Hopefully that makes sense. And again, we've done this in class, so I'm not rehashing or, or, or doing anything new. If we define this distance to be h, then the new x-coordinate there will be x plus h. So if you're standing at x on the x-axis, and I say, hey, take h steps to the right, your new location where you're standing is x plus h. The coordinates of this point will now be x plus h, that's the x-coordinate, oops, comma f of x plus h, which is the y-coordinate. And again, let's write the slope of the secant line. The slope of the secant line would be y2, which is f of x plus h, minus y1, which is f of x, all over x2, which is x plus h, minus x1, which is just x. Now, if we clean up the denominator, we the x's will cancel out, and we are left with f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, because the x's cancel each other out. Lo and behold, that's the difference quotient formula. So hopefully you see we're finding the slope of the same exact green line. We just label things differently based on on the left-hand side, we're taking two points. Both points have known locations, and we're saying this point is fixed, and we're going to take the second point and bring it closer. With the image on the right, we're saying the first point is fixed, the second point is h units away, and if h gets smaller, the distance between the two points has to shrink, and then the second point is getting closer to the first one. They're both doing the exact same thing. The only difference is in notation. How are we representing uh, the two points? Are we representing them with locations, or are we representing them through the distance between the two? Um, one way to, perhaps an alternative way to think about this would be if you think of the state of Florida, let's say Boca is somewhere down here and Orlando is somewhere here. There's a couple of ways to define the relationship between the two cities by saying, okay, this distance is roughly 300 miles. Or you can say, this is where Boca is and this is where Orlando is. You can talk about the location of the two cities, or you can talk about Boca being the fixed starting point and then saying, hey, go about 300 miles north and maybe make a left turn and you'll end up in Orlando. So that's the idea being discussed here. Two different types of uh, perspectives on slope. Uh, that's that. Hopefully that clarifies the fact that they really are the same or reinforces the importance of it. Uh, when we get the derivatives, everything will revolve around this discussion of average rate of change versus instantaneous rate of change. Um, for units 2, 3, 4, and 5, this is absolutely necessary. We cannot run away from this comparison and contrast, so please, please, please make sure you don't just memorize it, but think deeply about this so that you understand that the two formulas are the same. And if we're just finding the instantaneous rate of change, all we need to do is stick a limit in front of either formula.
Uh, next thing that students have had consistent trouble with is composition of two functions and then finding the limit. So I'll do an example that hopefully illustrates that. So this is some function f of x. This is 1, that's 2. Solid dot there, function goes through that point. And let's say we have another function g, which looks like, i got to make sure I draw it correctly. Let's say like so. And let's make the other one be down here. So this is our function g of x. And this is 2, 1, 2, 3. This is negative 1. And the question might say, find the limit as x approaches 1 of g of f of x. So two ways to think about this, or two things should always cross your mind. Number one, is there a limit property that I can use to finish this problem in 10 seconds? The limit property is that if we find the limit or if we're asked to find the limit as x approaches 1 of g of f of x, that's the same as g of the limit of f of x as x approaches 1. However, the caveat for this problem or for this limit property to apply was that the inside limit has to exist and the function g has to be continuous at that number. So let's try to evaluate what the limit is as x approaches 1 for f of x, and then we'll see if g is continuous there. So if we find the limit of f of x as x approaches 1, you'll notice that as x approaches 1 from the left, the function gets closer and closer to 2, and as x approaches 1 from the right, the function gets closer and closer to 2 as well. So we say that the limit exists, and it is 2, because the limit from the left and the limit from the right are the same number. So that's what the two-sided limit is, or that's what the overall limit is. Now we need to look at g of 2, and does that exist in order to see if g is continuous at 2? So if we look at this graph on the right-hand side, we notice that g of 2 is not even defined. So the, first, the very first condition for continuity fails, so we can say with certainty, g is not continuous at 2. So the limit property does not apply. We have to abandon ship and say, well, we couldn't have done that. So we come back. And now we have to go back to the default, which is find the limit from the left and find the limit from the right. So we do the exact same thing that we just did. But in particular, we find the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x, and let's think about just that. With compositions, you want to keep in mind that it's not the answer for the inside limit that matters, it's the way you get to the inside limit. So here, as x approaches 1 from the left, the y values that lead up to 2 are important. So here, you might have 1.9, then you might have 1.99, then you might have 1.999, and then finally you get to 2. So the path that we're getting or that we're taking to get to 2 is we're approaching the number 2 but from the left side because it's 1.9, 1.99, 1.999, and then finally we get very, very close to 2. So we say, hey, we're getting to 2, but we're doing so from the left. Now what happens if we find the limit as x approaches, oh, this should be from the left, what happens if we do the same as x approaches 1 from the right? Well, we look at the same picture. As we approach 1 from the right, what are these y values doing as we get closer and closer to 2? Well, they start at 1.9, 1.99, 1.999, and then we get to 2. So we are still approaching 2, but we're doing so from the underside or from the left side. So. The limit, whether we approach it from the left or from the right, what turns out here is that the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is 2 from the left. No matter which side of 1 we come from, f of x is going to get closer to 2, and it's always going to be from the underside or from the left-hand side. The y values in either direction are rising up to get to 2, 
not climbing down to get to two. Now we think of, well, what is it that has to happen with g of x? So if we find the limit as x approaches 1 of, oh, sorry, x approaches 2 from the left of g of x, remember this is what's plugging in there. So if we find the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of g of x, as x approaches, oops, as x approaches 2 from the left, the function is getting closer and closer to 3. And that is our answer. So the original limit, x approaching 1 of g of f of x, would be 3. Hopefully that maybe clarifies things a bit. Uh, just to make sure that everything is really sticking, Let's say that this ends up going up further. Let's see what that would do to our problem. So we do the same analysis. First, we, we try and we hope that the limit property works. So as x approaches 1 from the left and we approach 1 from the right, the limit is still 2. However, the function g is not continuous at 2. There's no g of 2, so the first condition still fails. So then we say, OK, let's think about it from left and right. The limit of f of x as x approaches 1 from the left is still going to be 2, and it's still going to be 2 from the left because the y values are coming up to get to 2. As you can see here, it's 1.9, 1.99, 1.999, 1.99999. 1 so we're rising up to get to 2. Excuse me. As we approach 1 from the right, now we're coming from the top side. So 2.1, 2.01, 2.001, 2.0000, 2 and then eventually we get to 2, but this means we're approaching 2 from the right. So are we approaching, as x approaches 1, are we approaching 2 from the same direction? No. So we would have to split this up as just that. If we approach g of x from the left of 2, as we approach 2 from the left, what is happening to g of x? Well, that limit is 3. So we have that. What happens if we approach 2 from the right for g of x? If we approach 2 from the right of g of x, now we're approaching negative 1. Are these two limits the same? The, le the limit from the left and the limit from the right must be the same in order for the limit to exist. They are not, so we would say the limit of g of f of x as x approaches 1 does not exist because the limit of g from the left and the limit from g the limit of g from the right does not exist all of this is to say that the path of the inside function is important you have to know whether you're approaching two from the left in both cases or if you're approaching two from the left and then once from the right then you have to use that direction to look at what g is doing is g being approached from the left or is g being approached from the right Hopefully that clarifies composition of limits a bit. I, I did send out another resource. So if this is still not, if you're still on shaky ground on how to answer these questions, uh, please make sure that you read that set of notes that I sent out, I think yesterday or day before. It's, it's definitely within the last three days for sure. Um, oh, and students were saying, well, what happens if we have to find the limit of f of f of x? as x approaches some number c. So here, chances are you're going to be given a graph. So let's say it looks like that. My case would be, and let's say this is c, uh, my case to you would be just copy it over again. And then treat it the same way as you treated f and g. So here we have to find the limit of g of f of x. Here we have to find the limit of f of f of x. So use this as your first function. And when you need to find f of f of x, 
look at the second picture. Since the two functions are the same, you can just copy the image over and say, okay, I'm going to treat this as f and I'm going to treat this as new f or outside f. Uh, maybe that helps. Inside f and outside f. So you can do the exact same analysis that we did here, but even if the functions are the same, it's more do you understand conceptually what's going on as opposed to do I have to do something different for f of f of x or do I have to do something different for g of f of x? The last thing I wanted to point out is an algebraic concept. So this is something you hopefully are familiar with. Um, when you find a solution to a system of linear equations, so you might have equations that look like this, x plus y equals 6, x minus y is equal to 8, and then you would you know, solve this system using any number of different ways. One of the ways to do that is by graphing. So if you were to graph the equations of the two lines, I'm not saying that the equations on the left are going to be the ones from the right, but either way, once you graph them, the point of intersection that you get, whatever value of x you get and whatever value of y you get, that will actually be the solution to this system. If you're trying to find where two functions intersect each other, you set the two functions equal to each other and you find where they intersect on the graph. So if I said, tell me where x squared plus 5x minus 6 equals negative 7, or let's make it easier to graph, let's say 4. This is a quadratic equation. This is a quadratic equation that you should be able to solve using the quadratic formula by first setting it equal to 0, yada, yada, yada. However, if we're looking at this geometrically, what we should be thinking, and again, this is not drawn perfectly. This is just to get the point across. x squared plus 5x minus 6 is a parabola, and it crosses the x-axis somewhere, so let's say it looks like that. Again, not the exact graph, but you get the idea that it's a parabola opening up. If we want to know when x squared plus 5x minus 6 would equal 4, well, what happens if we graph y equals 4? That's a horizontal line. So this is y equals 4, and this is the quadratic function. The points of intersection here and here will actually be the two solutions that pop out of solving this equation algebraically. So if you ever want to know where two functions are the same, all you have to do, if you have access to a graphing calculator, what you can do instead of solving an equation algebraically is graph both functions and then look for where they intersect. Those will be the values of x that satisfy this equation. So one of the questions I think on the review that's in the calc active portion of the test is I think something like this. It was e to the bx and it might have been 1.5 bx plus 2 perhaps. And this is happening at uh, x. I don't remember the exact uh, boundary points, but let's just pick them. So here you have these two functions, e to the bx and 1.5 bx plus 2. And the question says something like, find the value of b that will make this function continuous. Well, in order to find the value of b that makes the function continuous, you would have to satisfy three conditions. f of b, uh, f of 2 must exist. The limit as x approaches 2 of f of x must exist. And then finally, the function value must equal the limit as x approaches 2 of the same function. So these three conditions need to be satisfied. And because it's in the calc active portion of the test, f of 2, well, would be... We look at the first piece, it would be e to the 2x, uh, 2b. We replace x with 2, and we get e to the 2 times b. But I don't know what b is, so I have to move on past that. 
The second condition requires that if I find the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x, whatever this limit turns out to be, that has to be the same as e to the 2b. Now, I have a piecewise defined function, so I have to look at it from left and from the right. So if I look at it from the left, I'm looking at values that are less than or equal to 2. So I'm going to use the first piece, e to the bx. And here, direct substitution would give me e to the 2b. If, on the other hand, I look at x values approaching 2 from the right, I would have 1.5 bx plus 2 as the piece I consider. And then if I do direct substitution, I would get 3b plus 2. Now, you have two limits, e to the 2b and 3b plus 2. In order for the function to be continuous, both those limits have to be the same thing. If the two limits are not the same, the second condition fails and the function is not continuous. So in order for the function to be continuous, in order for this limit to exist, the limit from the left and the limit from the right have to be pointing at the same number. This is where the calculator comes in because I have no idea how to solve this equation. If we were to set e to the 2b equal to 3b plus 2, and I think it's a very good exercise to try to solve this equation and see that you can't. You have to get a feel for, hey, wh why would I not be able to solve this? It looks similar to things we've done in the past, but it actually isn't. Oops. Uh, and I'm going to leave that up to you guys. I need you guys to struggle with this and understand why everything you throw at it is not going to work. So please make sure you spend a good amount of time to convince yourself that we cannot solve this equation manually. We have to use a machine to be able to do it. So what you'd, you're being asked to find here is, if you were to graph e to the 2b, and you graph 3b plus 2, so e to the 2b is an exponential function, so it will for sure look something like this. And again, this is a rough sketch. 3b plus 2 is a linear function with a positive slope, so it's going to look something like that. The y-intercept is 2, so it goes somewhere there. And then e to the 2b might go through like that. So there are two x values for which the functions intersect. Whatever this x value is and whatever this x value is, those will be the solutions to this equation. So all you have to, well, it makes it sound very easy, but all you really have to do is graph e to the 2x because your calculator doesn't understand what b is. So what you're doing is graphing e to the 2x in your machine. You're graphing 3x plus 2 in your machine. And you're looking where are these two points the same. So you can click on trace on your calculator, which is uh, f4, and then basically be able to walk along a curve and just look for the x value. I think this x value is negative 2.998. I forget the exact one here, but it was, I think, 0 0.6 something. So again, anytime you're asked to find where two functions are equal, one way to do it is to set the two functions equal to each other and solve for x or b or whatever your variable is, if you can do that algebraically. On the other hand, if you cannot do that algebraically, and you have access to a graphing calculator, which again, you will on this entire test, make sure that you offload some of the work to it. Uh, also, as a friendly reminder, everything on the AP Calculus exam needs to be rounded correctly to three decimal places. So that's why you'll see answer choices with three decimal places rounded correctly. I hope that helps. Uh, those were all the things that I've seen so far that folks were uh, making simple, silly errors on. Hopefully that helps. Uh, if you have any questions, as always, please feel free to reach out. Have a nice day.